This week, Jeremy Miller, CEO of the SecOps Cyber Institute, and Philip Niedermeyer, CEO of the National Cyber Group, are here to talk about fighting the cyber war with battlefield tactics. Uh, then we'll be discussing in the security news how to encrypt AWS RDS MySQL replicas. Probably not the right complete way in any case. Cyber criminals are using Google's reCAPTCHA to hide their phishing campaigns. The NSA shares a list of vulnerabilities commonly exploited to plant web shells using Python pickling to explain insecure deserialization and how half a million Zoom accounts were compromised by credential stuffing. Then we're going to talk about asset management, vulnerability management, prioritization of remediation uh, amongst ourselves, and then transition into a deep dive demonstration of Qualys VMDR, an end-to-end -end solution for all of those things. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Qualys has brought together vulnerability management and patch management, letting security teams discover vulnerabilities and apply patches immediately, all within a single unified app. Sign up for a free trial of Qualys VMDR, vulnerability management, detection, and response today at securityweekly.com forward slash Qualys. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome to the show. But first, let me introduce you to a man who is living proof that behind every great man is a 55 gallon drum of lube, Mr. Paul Asadorian. Welcome, everyone, to Paul Security Weekly, episode 649, recorded on April 30th, 2020, at G Unit Studios in Rhode Island. Yes, I am the lone uh, host here in studio, remotely, of course, Mr. Jeff Mann. Jeff, welcome. Hey, happy to be here as always. And I decided a couple days ago when the uh, lockdown is lifted, the first place I want to get back back to is g unit studios excellent excellent miss you guys miss you and too I, and I, mr. I miss being able to smoke a cigar during the show yes <laughs> mr lee neely welcome ah great to be here from uh, we're socially distanced over here in the boise area uh, definitely been looking forward to this all day and we'll see what happens mr tyler robinson is here with us remotely as well buenos dias Hopefully we have like a big unquarantining party. Now I'm curious if the, the hand sanitizer but next to you is for like injecting or is that like actual like for the hands? Both, actually. Yes, both. <laughs> uh, I remember. So we are looking for high quality guest suggestions for all of our podcasts, including Enterprise Security Weekly. You, the listeners, can submit uh, guest suggestions by going to securityweekly.com forward slash guests, and we review those on a regular basis and bring folks on the show accordingly. Um, I would like to introduce our guests for this segment, Jeremy Miller. Having served as an Army Green Beret in the Special Forces, Jeremy is no stranger to hard work, selfless service, and perseverance. He started and runs an application development company, Cybersecurity Training and Protection. He is honored to join the fight to protect our country from cyber attacks. Jeremy, welcome. Hey, thanks, Paul. Hey, how did I make it past your screening credentials? <laughs> <laughs> you most certainly do. Well, you know what it was? We shared cigars uh, one oh, time. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> I, got you, I got you drunk. That's, that's right. it. <laughs> that too. Yeah, and the best part of the cigars, they were free cigars. That's right. Yeah. Philip was there as well. Yeah. Philip Niedermeyer, he's the managing we director. We sponsors. Of strategic alliances, Philip's role is to develop and nurture high-value relationships, oh, building Phillip. synergy and identifying opportunities in the marketplace 
for clients. Phil, welcome back to the show. Great to be here, Paul. Thank you for what you do. You keep the nation and our community informed, engaged, and connected. And this is a vital part of our national security process. Yes. Thank you, Philip. Uh, it is, uh, it's good to fill that, fill that role. We love coming on every week talking about uh, the latest stuff and uh, highlighting folks uh, such as Jeremy and yourselves uh, fighting the good fight along with us. Uh, Jeremy, tell us a little bit about your background uh, and how you came to found uh, your organization. Sure. So, you know, I, I, I do have some background in the special forces and um, actually I was uh, very fortunate to uh, have used uh, Jeff's uh, Wizzy Wheel actually. And, uh, That's and awesome. that was uh, interesting getting to meet him at, uh, at one of the parties at uh, Black Hat uh, last year and uh, knowing who, who put that together. So I had been trained in the, the one-time pads and the, the early cryptological uh, means of, of this. Um, and uh, so that part of things happened for me. Uh, spending time in the Special Forces was great. Uh, I was in twice. Uh, I was in early 90s. I got to go to Somalia, got out for 10 years, and uh, went back in and went to Afghanistan and got back out again. And in between, I fortunate enough to uh, – start several ventures, uh, real estate, uh, some, some uh, security um, development side. Uh, we do some uh, web applications in the real estate space. And um, a friend of mine asked me, he says, hey, I want to start training people in the cybersecurity space. And I'm like, uh, hmm. well, you know, only if we can do this at scale. I don't want to just train a couple people. How are we really going to make a difference? And um, so that's what it's been all about for me is how – how can I come in and help with what knowledge I have and um, and add to the fight? Yeah, Jeremy, I, I, in you know our, our audience kind of you know varies, of course, but I think in outside of our audience, perhaps the general public, when you say like I was in the special forces or you talk about special forces, I think the conjure images of folks in battle, which is not you know of course inaccurate, right? But they they picture a soldier engaging in combat, but a huge part of a lot of the armed forces and uh, the special forces branches is not so much combat, but actually forming relationships and gathering uh, intelligence uh, and things of that nature. So ex could you explain kind of that, that aspect of it? Cause it very much ties into your, your mission today. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I, as far as the special forces goes, they're typically um, older soldiers, uh, more mature soldiers. Uh, their critical thinking skills are a little bit better than most. Um, I would venture to say that they are better than most just because I know who I've been around and I've, I've been fortunate to uh, stand on the shoulders of giants in that field. Uh, there are plenty of people that are better than me. Um, but as a team, we all come together and, uh, and do that. And intelligence gathering is one. And, and one of the other things that we, that we did, one of the other missions was um, it's, um, it's winning the hearts and minds, as you talk about. And, and sometimes we go in and we uh, develop the local soldiers to be able to fight. And um, I'll give you an example, like in Afghanistan, um, you know, we would go out and assess the village and, and say, well, how can we help you support, um, protect yourself better and, and fight? Uh, typically, the, any of the coalition forces wouldn't have been able to make it there in time and they would probably all die before we did. Um, so they had to have some level of uh, protection. And so that particular concept is what leads me into what our next phase of SecOps Cyber Institute is, which is um, called Lionfish Cybersecurity, where we actually are going to be a force multiplier is what it's called. Um, and in Dubai, there's a, there's a saying called buy with and through uh, your partner force. So we want to take these small to mid-sized companies that cannot get uh, traditional help uh, because of some things we'll go into in a little bit later, but and um, help them to do some self-aid, uh, to have a, a basic knowledge, to get to a level so that they're not the low-hanging hanging fruit for the script kitties and and all the the low the lower-level um, attackers and make them a harder target. Mm -hmm. I, I can't help but be reminded of uh, one of my favorite films of all time, The Seven Samurai, right? It's very much a similar story, right? Your army. When you said that, you know, the local villages, right, it kind of conjured up uh, those images. And, and that's, you know, a, an extremely 
useful skill as applied to cybersecurity. You know, many of us have done similar kinds of things, taking people who uh, are not necessarily exposed to all the technology and things in cybersecurity and bringing them up to speed so they can uh, defend their networks. But you want to do that at, at, at scale. So what were some of the motivating factors behind, you know, forming this organization and uh, how do you plan to do it at scale? Yeah, so I... I mean, just saving one person or one company does not really solve the problem. Um, if we, we're all in this together, um, you know, as, as I understand it, I mean, you could hack somebody, they could move up to the next company. Um, you know, I reminds me of a, a meme. I've become quite a meme person now. And I, it reminds me of the meme where the boat's sinking in the front and the people in the front are like bailing out water and the people in the back are way up. And they're saying, well, it's a good thing we don't have a hole on our side. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, come on, we're all going to fail if we don't all succeed. So we all need to come together and make this, make it happen. And I know uh, one of Jeff's uh, sayings is, um, you know, we're going to be more secure. You know, what does that mean? But um, it, it's got to be more than what they are now. There's just low hanging targets. I would like to say something, Paul, to your audience. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I'd like to say this to all the cyber uh, experts in the field that my hat's off to you. And, you know, I spent some time on the front line and, and people like you supported people like me. And it's my turn to support you and your fight to help stand beside you and help guide things that I can, I can help guide uh, to help us all be more successful. And I, I hope I bring something to the table. Yeah. And, and Jeremy, I wanted to ask if you could give a couple examples of um, and I think it's an extreme example of how you get uh, people of a lower skill level in, in anything to be up to a certain skill level in a short period of time, right? And that, that's really the skill that I, I think uh, needs to be highlighted here. And I'm curious to, to know like what specific tactics and techniques are used in that situation. Sure. So what we are going to, to do in that situation is we are actually, one, one of the things, let me, let me back up for a second and say this. Um, so we're, we're using the CMMC model, all the practices in the model, not all of them, right? Not all the way to level five, but, but we are going to use those as we go and help not only the DOD contractors, but also the, any small business, small to mid-sized business, excuse me, along their path. We're going to go through and go through each practice one at a time and complete it. We're going to teach them why they're doing it, how they're going to do it, um, what happens if they don't do it. And, you know, and as you guys all know in this community, it's not just a checklist. It's a mindset. Security is a mindset because just as soon as you check that box, somebody's going to go plug some other IoT device in and screw everything up. But if everybody's not on the same page in this, they could be, they could be in trouble. But it, it's interesting, you know, if you're special forces and you're training a village to defend themselves and basically fight for their lives, how does that translate to on making a small business understand that they're under attack from, you know, cyber criminals that are the unseen enemy. And in, it could be life or death, but likely it's not, right? Well, so life or death, um, f physically, yeah. But um, the company-wise, mm. sure it can be, right? I mean, uh, what's the average right now? The uh, the average is one hundred and fifty dollars to $200,000 to help uh, once they get hacked. I mean, that, that, that will put down most small businesses right there alone. Mm -hmm. For sure. And it, so, do you, I mean, I'm sorry, it, it's Jeremy, in the news everywhere. I mean, they can't get away from seeing all the cyber attacks that are happening to government, big companies, small companies, it's going to happen to them and they need to get to some level of proficiencies. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we plan on coming, stand alongside them with our experts to help mentor, train them through that process, um, teach up a few other people. I think what will end up happening is as we go into these companies and we take, I'm going to say the the clerk or the um, you know somebody that's got some level of computer knowledge, it doesn't matter what their current job is. By the way, um, if they've got the skills to um, and the thinking process to to understand what we're doing, but um, but by helping them raise their standard, coming through and understanding that they are there to protect that company. This is. This is that whole um, hero's journey kind of thing. Mm. We're taking the guy that has nothing to do with this. All of a sudden, he's thrown into a whole world of, of uh, Alice in Wonderland, right? And, and he becomes the hero because they, in fact, are the hero. Every one of you guys that are cybersecurity experts, 
are the hero of our world right now. And um, I can't stress that enough. And I think that I, you know, as much as I've been around a, a lot of the guys, I don't think they quite realize how special they are. And my goal is to teach that, is to train that, is to show that. And um, if they get that from me, then I, I would hope that they excel in their path. Other questions from uh, the other hosts? I don't want to hog the questions, as it were. Um, so I was just going to ask, um, so it's a great mission. What are you seeing as, as, as initial barriers to, uh, to moving forward? Where, 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 are you, where are you seeing a, a challenge? You know, probably mostly is going to be funding. I mean, I've pocket funded all this so far. And, um, you know, we'll, hopefully we'll be looking for a series here soon. But uh, funding, I've, I've, uh, I've assembled a, a fantastic team. I am, I am beyond myself uh, to, to understand uh, the people that have stood, that are standing beside me now that want this mission. And uh, I am, I'm very humbled, to be honest with you. But, but it's going to be funding. And where do you think you're going to make your first uh, forays? Where are you in terms of uh, what type of market segment you think would be most ready to step up to to see what you can help them with? Well, so or do you have a clue? I mean, CM, CMMC right now is the low hanging fruit from that perspective. They have to fix their problem, or they're not. As you know, they're not going to be able to uh, bid on any DoD contracts. So they're they're going to be our first target. But but by by no no small uh, step are they the end of it. Jeremy, could you describe for our audience CMMC? Yeah, so as I think some some of your other podcasts have, have alluded to, but it's the Cyber Maturity uh, Model Certificate. And um, Katie Arrington, if you've not seen any of her talks, has just been fantastic. Um, I got to see her live over at DreamWorks um, a couple of months ago, and um, it, it's just it's fantastic. So the DOD itself has has determined that they're tired of getting their ass kicked and uh, getting the IP stolen, all the money stolen and hacked out of their contractors, their, their primes and subs. So, you know, from the NIST standard, they've asked everybody to self-attest. They weren't necessarily doing that, or they mm -hmm. were at self-attesting, I guess, but, but they weren't mm -hmm. necessarily always doing the things they said they were. So they've come up with this model to have uh, independent auditors to go audit them and, and make sure that they're doing it. And so uh, they've got a great plan, and um, I'm happy to see uh, stepping stones to help all, all businesses if they follow that model. I, I find um, it, it interesting that uh, when I've worked with small businesses, especially in a security capacity, there's really two drivers, right? There's we got hacked is a driver, not just for small businesses, but for everyone from an individual all the way up to the largest enterprises, right? The other driver is that small business wants to or is in the process of doing business with another likely larger company. And that larger company says, hey, in order to do business with us or be partnered with us, you have to meet these minimum security standards. And in the past, that was kind of, you know, a mixed bag. I think there are, are better standards today uh, that companies can go to. And usually that event, hopefully before they were breached, right, would trigger, hey, we need to bring in a security expert of, of some kind. Are you exploring kind of those avenues? And do you agree that those are probably the two major drivers for at least small business, right? Yeah, good, good point on that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, soon I think every company is going to have to do that or nobody's going to want to do business with them. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got a select few that, that want to push that blame down. So why not make them have their, uh, their security tight? Uh, I'll, how do you? I'll, oh, go ahead, Tyler. I was gonna say, how do how do you see that um, kind of coming to fruition? It's something that we've we've all kind of said in in one way or another on the show. Like as consumers, how do we push companies and and not purchase company you know product that are not doing good security as a big company to company or business to business relationships? How do we ensure that our partners and uh, other companies that we're utilizing, maybe it's a contractor, how do we ensure that they're doing better security? Because at the end of the day, from a consumer standpoint, we have very little control over large corporations and monetary decisions that, that they do, because at the end of the day, it's all about money, right? So how do we start to enforce this a little bit better to where you're having kind of the same idea that we are, having that 
kind of standardized security. If you're not going to have a good security platform, you're not going to at least adhere to some kind of a standard, uh, then people aren't going to do business with you because they don't see that. That's not the general consensus and not the general public today. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a complex question, but um, I think eventually the government may uh, make everybody. It's like having insurance, right? It's This is the, the insurance policy that the company you're working with is following certain guidelines and certain standards. Um, we we want to give all the businesses that go through all the steps of CMMC, whether they're audited or not, give them a certificate saying, hey, we've actually done these steps. So they may be more... Um, more uh, marketable to their vendors and to their uh, to their buyers and suppliers uh, because they are following a standard that, that they need to do. Uh, on that point, uh, Philip, I want to ask you a, a question in that if you're a small business, often the barrier to implementing additional security controls, those controls come at a cost. Are there federal programs here in the U.S. that if I'm a small business, I want to go get the CMMC certification, for example, are there programs where there's a grant that I can apply for to say I want to do this and get some extra funding? Was that? The, that was to you. Yeah. For you, so, yeah. So I'm not an expert in government funding by a long shot, but there are a variety of programs to support small businesses and whether you can uh, apply for them for the context of cybersecurity identity. Hmm. Interesting. Paul, I'll, I, I can Jeremy? address yeah. that um, for a second if you want. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to get, Philip was quiet, so I was also trying to get Philip. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> I, I just uh, I knew that Philip probably didn't didn't have that answer. But um, so in Indiana, where I'm at, <clears throat> they came up with a program, which was brilliant. Um, it was um, for, um, it's called Next Level Jobs. They took federal funding and they, they applied some of that towards education of, the workforce to help everybody uh, increase their their salary, increase their knowledge, and all this. We we started down this path to leverage that until co um, to this virus happened, but um, where we could actually go in and they will pay us to come train their people. Mm. We are wrapping th the way we're going to go in here is not just saying, "Hey, we're going to train." Hey, we're going to do a security management program. Hey, we're going to mentor. We're wrapping all that together. I'm trying to buy down all of the vendors and all of the, all of my partners so that I can come in with an affordable package to plop in and help these guys. So I was able to figure out, well, we'll just take the training dollars and we won't just take the training dollars and run away. We're going to take the training dollars and give them a 12 month product that now they can be secure. So now these companies got the, would get the grant and um, not have to pay as much money out of their pocket. Now, they don't have this kind of thing all over the country. I wish they would. I would hope that if I can prove this concept works, we would be able to get some federal funding and be able to do this for everybody. And they wouldn't have to worry about paying uh, too much out of their pocket because, you know, SMBs don't have that much money. I, I'm particularly concerned, or at least would like to segue, uh, and, and Jeff, this somewhat is for you as well, uh, into the retail space, as a lot of small businesses are uh, retail establishments where they're accepting payment from, you know, people in the stores. And I've seen like hundreds of different point of sale systems with all kinds of different technology. And oftentimes there's fairly significant vulnerabilities, uh, in said technology. Uh, you know, mm. especially when it sits on the table, when you're at a restaurant and there's a tablet, I mean, me as a hacker, I just can't help but like, you know, Google the model number and just probe it. Tyler's laughing because he's done the same thing, right? <laughs> like, can I get into the admin console on here? But the, it runs the gamut of uh, of security vulnerabilities. Now, Jeff, is there, are there things in PCI that help retailers out specifically with evaluating point of sale systems and putting security as a component? Uh, and then a general question, like, what do we do to help the overall security aspect of these point of sale systems? Well. Uh, it's a long, complicated answer, and the answer is yes and no. Yes, if you're a retailer that's big enough mm -hmm. that you are going under the scrutiny of a level one uh, PCI assessment and you have a QSA, a third party coming in and assessing you, that's what I used to do. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's about 1% of the company, and, and I'm being generous at saying 1% yeah. of the companies that are out there that are subject to PCI. The Everybody else, the small, medium-sized businesses, mom and pop shops uh, that are, you know, you're mentioning restaurants. I can't tell you how many times I've been at bars and restaurants 
uh, during, before, after hacker security conferences where there's point of sale parties going on, not naming names, but it's pretty common. But th the problem with those organizations is because they don't have somebody coming in as a third party saying, hey, this is what the security rules are that you need to follow. Uh, they largely are at the at the mercy of vendors that come in and say, hey, use our stuff and and you'll be fine for PCI. So you don't have to worry about it. Don't have to think about it. PCI compliance made easy. The burden mm -hmm. of PCI is taken away. And while there's uh, some companies that do that in a responsible manner, and I'll, I'll cite Square as an example. Okay, um, yeah, that's where I was going, sure. Square uh, plays by the rules, and, and and they but they take on the liability of all the merchants that use the the Square. They they say we're a service provider, we're a payment processor, and we're we're a, we're going to we're going to vouch for all of our merchant customers use our stuff. So it's really on them to wow. provide whatever security and encryption mm -hmm. goes into the Square product, notwithstanding what it's being plugged into and whatnot. But if any of their little small customers that use it at a you know, a flea market or are selling T-shirts at a hacker conference, uh, Square is going to Square is going to foot the bill for any any loss of, of any credit card data due, due to a breach mm -hmm. uh, of Square itself. But that's Square. There's tons of other yeah. vendors out there that uh, let's just say mileage varies, mm. and 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 the and the road is wide. Jeremy, have and you uh, sorry? Have you considered the, the kind of retail point of sale aspect to? Uh, to training and making recommendations, maybe not for specific vendors, although I, it's clear that I, I agree with Jeff on on the Square front uh, as well. Um, but you know, making recommendations, but uh, on how to evaluate these point of sale systems, which are often sometimes the reason why small businesses are attacked. So, uh, yes and no. Right now, our focus is the CMMC portion of it. And I realize that there are certain things that go into the uh, point of sales side. Um, and some of that will be addressed um, with that. But there are other, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't there other additional uh, requirements that are needed for the point of sale side? Uh, other than the again, CMMC? Well, CMMC is not technically required for a, a, a typical retailer, but I would say that the requirements found in CMMC and you uh, as a quick pitch or plug uh, I think we talked about CMMC on security and compliance weekly episode hmm. 23 I think it was Johnny the voice in my ear correct me if I'm wrong um, but but the the levels uh, that uh, that CMMC um, spell out and the different things that you have to do to, to achieve each level, all of that is effectively found in PCI because PCI, CMMC, a lot of the security compliance uh, regulations and frameworks that are out there all roughly say the same thing in terms of, you know, at a, at a big, at a macro level, at a big picture. Um, all right, Johnny says I was right, episode 23. Um, so... You know, it's not specifically cited, but the things that you do, the details that you do are 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 required. The problem is with the small merchants is all they do is they go out to a payment processor that gives them a point of sale system and says, we got everything covered for you. If they're doing PCI at all, they're filling out what's ca called a self-assessment questionnaire. And it's tailored in theory to how they're doing commerce. You know, if they're a website or if they're a you know, a point of sale at a restaurant and all they got is the little things that they're walking around to the table or they're, I don't know that these exist anymore, but maybe they do in some places. I haven't seen them in a while, but if you've got a, you know, call it in, call in the charge or, over a dial up or a, um, Gosh, what were those things called after phones? Tele telephones, fax machines? <laughs> no, the the next level of, of, of speed. I, I'm having an old person moment. Modem? Keep it on DSL line. DSL, DSL lines. Yeah. DSL lines. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so if you're calling in or if you're just using like a, 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 a web terminal and a web application based yeah. point of sale system, all the all the self assessment questionnaires are tr trimmed down and tailored to only ask for the requirements that are applicable, basically. Uh, and so there's a lot of trimming down. Um, 
the, the but the the large problem and and we're citing retail but i, I think uh, i think a lot of the same problems exist in the healthcare industry especially for smaller practices practices that aren't already affiliated with the you know the big major you know hospital chains and healthcare chains if if they're smaller practices if they're smaller offices um they're not getting the love and the attention uh, in a in a very similar manner to smaller restaurants, small to mid size, you know, uh, convenience stores and things like that. Um, so it's a unique challenge, and I do, Jeremy, you and I have talked about it. It, it. It's a somewhat unique challenge, and I think when we when we talked, what I thought was most compelling uh, was the idea uh, that you know you're. It, I don't know if you've mentioned it tonight because I was distracted for a minute, but the you were sort of uh, using the analogy of insurance, where you know an individual can't pay for the loss, um, and they can't afford a, a policy that's going to, you know, t- they can't afford to set aside money to pay for a catastrophic injury or something like that. But if you can get a hundred thousand people to put a little bit in a pot, and and that pot is available for the percentage of people that are going to be in this context, breached or suffer, suffer uh, uh, you know, an injury of some sort. You know, the the theory is that the insurance covers that. So I know you're not promoting insurance. You're promoting uh, and trying to figure out a way to sort of pool together best practices of, of security and and processes and, and and technologies and products as well, so that they can be made available to the companies that individually. Um, you know, can't necessarily afford them. So, so Paul, from a strategic factor, and, and really when we look at it, we've got to consider this as part of the big picture. As most of us are aware, the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission just issued their report, and the core of that report talks about a whole nation framework. And really, if you look down to the, the root of the matter, Jeremy's platform fits specifically into what Mark Montgomery and the team and the commissioners of the Cyberspace Solarium Cyberspace Commission have determined a critical pathway for our safety. We have to engage at all levels. Core of it has to be an education platform, which you know I'm working on, mm-hmm. and, uh, and you had me on the show talk about it before. Why I'm here tonight was to help Jeremy a little because we met in Las Vegas, I think. Was it Las Vegas? Um, in a coffee line mm-hmm. at a cybersecurity um, event. And we realized we had a tremendous amount in common. He was very good looking and had been in the special forces, and I had done nothing the rest, most of my life. <laughs> um, and, uh, but we did have a belief that the nation was struggling with this great issue of cyber. He had a vision of bringing it to the small business community. I wanted to address the huge gap that exists in people fundamentally educating K through 12, but also K through gray, changing the workforce to meet the nation's needs. By 2023, we're facing that huge job gap. That job gap is gonna exasperate the challenge that Jeremy's middle market and lower middle market businesses face because the cost for their protection will become instrumentally more expensive the fewer people we have trained to come into our industry. So as the Cyberspace Commission has looked at it, we have to take a whole nation approach. We have to begin at the earliest levels educating. We have to engage in all factors of the economy from small to middle market to the largest. We have to ensure that that network is complete. And we'll only complete it by engineering a platform which includes a structure which Jeremy's firm is looking to do to address the middle market needs as well. I in, uh, I love this the holistic approach. Uh, it, it ties together some discussions we had this week. And if I think about, you know, the next generation of people uh, here in the U.S. that will be the next small business, that could be retail, that could be your martial arts studio, that could be your electrician. Maybe they've got a technology startup. Maybe, you know, they're creating the next Fortune 100 company. But if the folks coming in have the education to understand security, 
that is extremely important to build it in from the beginning. I think that the, the current kind of generation creating these businesses is much more technology savvy, but not as savvy as they need to be when it comes to security. And then bring in, you know, Jeremy's program where there's additional training and how to execute on those security strategies is how we get every single business here in the U.S. to have that security mindset. And that's really what we want to, I think, build into every uh, aspect of our culture and especially business culture. When Reams came on Enterprise Security Weekly, we we're talking about having the, you know, the security champion uh, in each of the groups in the organization. And he said, I don't want to have people, he's like, it's great to have people that are security champions, but he said, I want, and this was very prolific, he said, I want the people who are making the decisions about the business and the software and the, the goods and the technology to be the security champions, to have the people who are actually making those decisions, not just people who are influencing, but actually making the decisions know about security enough to be able to get it right, at least most of the time. How? Yeah, hey, and, and Paul, on that, when we go in, what, our goal is not not just to train them and, and do an OJT, but also to immediately secure as best we can that company. So that's, 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 uh, that groundwork's laid. And then we'll go through every plan of the CMMC model um, in training those people um, on the on-the-job training piece of that and the, uh, mentor them through uh, the process. It's an apprenticeship without them being at a cybersecurity company with a with an expert next to them, yeah, it's it's our experts mentoring them through protecting that company. I, I agree, and Jeremy. I think, there has to be a tactical component to it as well because it, it all sounds great in theory and understanding, right? Uh, Tyler yeah. and then Jeff. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I kind of had two questions. So, as part of some of this training, uh, one of the things that we've kind of identified as a good means to get people on board with security is to make it applicable to them personally. Is part of the training being applied uh, able to be related to them personally and utilized from like a personal standpoint? And then kind of the second part to that with a lot of the younger generation starting to come up in the market and the work, the workforce uh, and a lot of these, you know, technology savvy kids have been used to or have grown up where security is not really a thing. Like I want my Instagram out there. I want my Facebook out there. I want people to see me. Uh, a EULA, I don't know what that is, you know, check the box. Privacy has become less of a kind of less of a concern to, hey, I think, hey, some hey, of Tyler, the younger generation. You're, you're kind of dated. It's Instagram and it's TikTok now. You're right. My bad. That was TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> so how do, how do we get these, how do we get these students or these up and coming people that are going to be making the decisions, kind of the next generation of decision makers, how do we start to get their mindset shifting? Because I, I feel like there's a gap there between like the older generation that doesn't like security, doesn't like computers and technology. Then you got that kind of middle ground. And then you got the people that just don't care about privacy and it's all technology, like just make it all do all the things. So there's kind of a, a, a gap there that you're going to have to fill in with, right? Well, I, so from, from my perspective, it's all about the, their, them, their families, the companies, and this country. And uh, our goal is to give them that awareness and that training. And, you know, I mean, I, I hope we don't have a bunch of people that are the mechanics that don't take care of their own car. Um, which is, I think, the analogy that, that you bring up in my mind when you say, how are we going to um, have them address their own personal needs? But, um, you know, the goal is that they know what to do. They can apply it at home. They can apply it with the rest of their family, too. Yeah, and, Jer and to Jeremy and, and Philip's point as well with the education piece, right? I'm going to give you a great example uh, about how I've educated my own family almost to a fault. Uh, 2.30 in the morning, our smoke detector goes off. Now we have a Nest Protect smoke detector, right? It's connected to the network, the whole thing. And it's going off in the middle of the night saying there's fire when there, there was no fire, thankfully. Uh, but everyone reacted. Now, my family's first reaction was, Dad, I think we're hacked. Someone hacked into our network oh, wow. and has influenced our systems and they're like going through their devices at 2.30 in the morning doing full-blown incident response because dad uh -huh. has always told us like this was going to happen and this is the moment where we've been hacked. It's just like that scene from Mr. Robot where they take over the house. I was so proud. 
it, it, but that's the kind of mindset I feel like we need to build into the education and in, in, wow. in business in business culture. As long as they're trained to respond if there's actually smoke in the house. Oh, absolutely. They and, are. And, yes. and they're not troubleshooting <laughs> as they're getting smoke. Let me tell you, killed. there's smoke in our house. Sorry. <laughs> that, that, there is smoke in our house. And smoke. we need to do something about it. There's smoke in our nation. And, you know, if we look at the, this hideous COVID crisis, what the Chinese were able to do with a bio crime in essence, which is what this is, think what they're going to be able to do in five years when they have fully developed their cyber warrior program and we are still unprepared. It's very true. It, it scares me. I'm reading uh, Countdown to Zero Day by Kim Zetter, finally getting uh, to that book. And, you know, that book in Stuxnet, of course, is several years old now. What scares me the most is, is where we're at today, because we're not talking about like, oh, this was the next Stuxnet. Why aren't we talking about that? It's flying under the radar is my fear, right? Uh, you know, kind of to your point, Phil, that there's, there's smoke in our house, but our smoke detectors aren't, aren't detecting it. Or we're at a st uh, in an arms race standstill uh, in, at some level in certain aspects. So well, I have smoke several detectors are detecting. It. I mean, people are it, it, the news is all over the place. We're getting hacked everywhere. It's like it's uh, hack overwhelm. I think it's just uh, this happens to people. Yeah, it's not I mean, as much of a news story. Numb to it, and it's not right. Mm -hmm. Jeff. Mm. So I, I had a couple thoughts, uh, and uh, somewhere in the middle is a, is a question or two. But uh, I, I think the the big problem that we have as a society that I, I have, uh, you know, that I tackled when I came out of the mil uh, not the, out of the government, out of the DoD, almost 25 years ago, and uh, don't think collectively my generation has done a particularly good job for for whatever reason um and and the thing that we're struggling with today is sort of the um the dichotomy if that's the right word that, that exists between cyber war and and sort of you know nation states going after nation states and the mission of the dod and the things that we that have that background are familiar with versus the private sector and just you know conducting commerce and and what i've encountered mostly over the last couple decades out in the private sector are people that think that the you know cyber war cyber security dod level security is something for you know that's for the government but that's not really for us because all we do is, and I, I think it was the Home Depot CEO that that put it in was published as saying what I what I've heard many times. Why should we care about security? We just sell hammers. Um, so um, there, there's this there's a difference in mission. There's a difference in budget. There's a difference in mentality. There's a difference in culture and mindset of security. So my question is, and maybe it's a, not as much of a question as an idea suggestion is maybe the, the training needs to not, not just be the educating people on why they need to do security and have more of a security mindset versus simply drop in the right kind of technology and forget about it because it's all taken care of. Maybe part of the training is, if if nothing else, trying to make the, the private sector more of an informed consumer. Uh, you know, the, re the restaurant that's uh, being approached by two or three different payment processors offering a couple different point of sale systems and they're looking at well which one's the cheapest this one's three cents on the dollar this is five cents on the dollar this one's four cents on the dollar and that's all they're looking at maybe they need to be looking at well what are what are some of the security controls what you know do, do they encrypt or don't they and where and how are keys injected what else should we worry about what are you know that's one example, but what I'm saying is maybe part of the training is not to make them security professionals, but just to make them a smarter consumer of security well, one, products. One, one hates to use the analogy, but one, we have to. 
if we look at what the cost is of the COVID-19 crisis that the world is facing at the moment, mm -hmm. it could exceed $30 trillion. It's a real number. Yep. It might be more. And what would it, the cost have been if we had properly prepared for this crisis? Or what would the cost have been if we hadn't allowed the Chinese to have such an incredible impact on our supply chain? All of these are factors in what is going to cost this global economy immensely and impact us in the next generation to come. Right. The same okay. factors are in play with cyber. Oh, absolutely. I, I agree. There's many parallels there. Um, uh, and I, I've been noodling over how do, how do we how do we do lessons learned but i mean yeah in the in the in this in the security world at least in the private sector for the last 25 years it's been you know every customer that i had that uh was breached you know they were all okay now we're going to do security right but the vast majority are like well it's not happened to us yet nothing's going wrong why should we worry about it why should we spend money what's the return what's the value and i think there's absolutely a lot of parallels between you know preparation and preparedness for something like a pandemic versus you know something that is just as elusive and i think a lot of people's understandings as a as a as a breach or a cyber event you're correct but in, in, in jeff to, along this point you know I, to go back to when we we're talking about uh nation state attacks and you know how they take place today i truly think that many of the attacks we're seeing against small businesses state and local governments are very much what we would call air quote cyber war Right. Mm -hmm. I, I very much think it's not just coincidence that we're having this huge ransomware problem with state and local governments. I don't think if you look into many of those attacks that they're after money. Right. I think they're after disruptions. I think that comes to elections. I think that ties into taking advantage of the COVID-19 situation with all of the scams and fraud that's happening now. It, it is very much an, uh, a, an attack against the nation, not so much the individual companies, which is. Jeremy, why I think your mission of helping small businesses is not just important for the survival of those businesses, but to help us defend the nation. Yeah, they're going to take our legs out from under us. Yep. That's basically what you're saying. And and um, and to your point, Jeff, on uh, training on vendor uh, security and uh, how to look at things. Yeah, we'll, we'll add that. That's a great suggestion. Um, I didn't look at it from that perspective, but we certainly want to um, bring value uh, in, in any aspect we can in that side. Uh, and on the changing of the perceptions. Um, yeah, I, that's, that's the thing I hear is uh, all the security guys that say, yeah, it's hard to get these small businesses to want to jump on board. They want to do, you know, to get this, this is what happened in the past. It's a new day. Today is a new day. And if we do not challenge and take on this day as if it's our last, it will be. And that's our mission. And that's the mission that I'm going to get out there. And that's the message we're going to talk about. And hopefully uh, we'll get uh, a lot of uh, people listening. But it's going to take all of us to make that uh, to make that happen. We're not an island. Nobody's an island in this. Well, the bottom the bottom line is As John Hume said nobody is an island. Right. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is, uh, Jeremy, we've gone downhill since we stopped using one-time pads. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Nice, yes. And to come full circle, is that yeah. pun intended? Oh. <laughs> All right. So, so, to so come full circle, we're probably closing. I would encourage our <laughs> eager audience to get a copy of the United States Cyberspace Solarium Commission report. I encourage you to report to read it. Engage with the commission. There are a series of events that are occurring across the nation over the next several months. I will be involved in two of them. Uh, we don't have firm dates because of the current crisis. One will be held at Greenport in partnership with Greenport at US Cyber Command. That's the National Cyber Group will be doing that. We focus on education. We're going to have a couple of virtual events. We're certainly going to tell you about them all. Mm. Maybe I'll come in and speak about them before we have them and bring some guests. Jeremy will certainly be involved in that. And then later in the year, we're going to do another event at the University of Baltimore, who just initiated a 
Cybersecurity MBA. I happen to have the privilege of being on their board there and helped initiate that program with Dr. Murray DL. So these are two fundamental programs that are working into the system. They're addressing the specific need we have of providing a platform, building a platform for education, and also building a platform for additional higher learning. Particularly, I'm excited about what Murray's doing down at UB, uh, an MBA in cybersecurity. There's very few of them. He's got a great program there. And um, we will be hosting different events, both virtual and actual in-person events, to support the, the uh, effort that Mark Montgomery and his team at the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission have been doing, and they've been doing great work. So go to their website and take a look at it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, Jeremy, I just have uh, five questions for you. They are the game we call Five Questions <laughs> with Security Weekly. Uh, we purposely Best do not prepare sure. you for these. Philip has gone through this. Uh, they're really easy. There's no right or wrong answer, and we don't judge you on the air. Okay. Are you ready? I think so. Okay. It doesn't That's matter. Fine. We're going to ask him anyway. Three That's words right. to describe yourself. Persistent, humble, and, uh, and grateful. If, you were, grateful. A, if yeah. you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? My finger. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? The Unknown Chapters. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Depends on how good looking she is. Choose two <laughs> celebrities to be your parents. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Oh, nice. Um... You know, uh, Sylvester Stallone would be my dad, and um, hmm, uh, Angelia Jolie, she could be my mom. Oh, that is, that is the most popular mom answer. That is, What's that? That, that is the answer. most popular answer for mom. Oh, okay. I, I said uh, Charlton Heston and Doris Day. Oh, yeah. she did. It's awesome. Well, Jeremy uh, and Philip, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly this evening. Always an honor. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Appreciate it, and thank you, uh, thank you for having us. Thank you so we much. Can't tell you With... how important it is what you do, Paul. Well, thank you. It's you, so you great. too, as well. Outstanding. Uh, with that, we'll take a short break. Come back with the security news for this week. Stay tuned.